last two years has been incredibly difficult for everyone, but the one thing that's kept me going through everything is music. And um, in fact, in all the hard, hardest points in my life, music has been the one thing that has been the constant. It's been the rock that I lean on when I have bad periods, dark periods. And tonight is about fucking forgetting all the bullshit, forgetting all the troubles, forgetting all the bad shit going on, just having it hard on the dance floor. And I'm thrilled to be back. And even more excited that you're going to be there tonight to share it with me. Let's fucking go! Let's fucking go! Yeah, I mean, the, the, the energy and the way the Argentinians dance, that sort of side to side, it's, it's, it's infectious. It's, it's like a, a, yeah, a sea of moving bodies that are just dancing as hard as they fucking can because why wouldn't you? <laughs> the last gig I played before COVID really shut the world down was in Groove two years ago, March 2020. And when I left, I think I left on, on the last flights that were leaving, and then everything just shut down. Are you rolling? Yeah, rolling. Yeah, okay. Interviewing John Askew, take one. Some people will say you could argue that early albums of Jean-Michel Jarre is trance, you know, which is from the 70s. You could argue that there were elements of trance in Pink Floyd's records. There are elements of trance in all kinds of psychedelic stuff from the 60s. But I would say real trance came from Germany. And where did it come from before that? It was Goa in India. Goa trance existed at the very beginning of trance. I think it was brought back to Germany, specifically Frankfurt. A lot of big records came from Fran Frankfurt and Hamburg. And then in sort of 1991, 1992, real trance started kicking off. But it was a lot harder, it was a lot faster. It was hard trance, you know. And, and then I kind of discovered it and got into it around 1993, 1994. And the artists were people like DJ Dag, Gail San, Mario De Bellis, um, uh, Schoenenberg, uh, Sven Vath was playing trance at that stage, West Bam, um, uh, Marisha. Um, you know, it was, it was a glorious period. I mean, fuck, even Carl Cox was playing a lot of trance in those days. He used to always open his sets with um, Cygnus X, the Orange theme, which was a huge, huge trance anthem, if you like. But, for me, that was, the, that was trance. But then what happened was the popularity of it exploded in 1998 slash 1999. And then you had a new style of trance, which was still pretty pumping, but a lot more commercial that people like um, Paul Van Dyke, Armin Van Buren, Judge Jules, Dave Pierce, you know, um, uh, Tiesto, all, all of those sort of artists then exploded in that period and this sort of new manifestation of trance was born. And I like the more underground part of that and I like the old underground style of trance and I also like hard techno. So my style of trance draws from those three areas but what I just don't like is cheese. You know, I'm, I love a good melody, I love a good vocal, I love a good, but it has to be the right kind of chords. It has to be the right sequence of chords so it never sounds too, you know, major key, happy, clappy, bullshit, cheese, you know, I'm not into that. So 
What is trance? Trance is a hypnotic music. The word trance means falling into some sort of hypnosis, being exposed to circumstances and sounds and other stimulations around you that cause you to go into some sort of hypnotic state. Trance has to be therefore about rhythms, repetitive rhythms. It has to be about driving energy and build-ups. And it's, for me, it's my favorite style of electronic music because I absolutely adore techno, but I don't want to listen to it all night. I absolutely adore all kinds of other styles, but I don't want to listen to it all night. I fucking love trance, but I don't want trance non-stop. But it's the right record to put in the mix for 80% of the night for me. I think 70% 70, 70 of my set will always be like driving, banging, hard, pumping, acid-filled acid trance. That's the shit I love. I came to Argentina, obviously, to play Groove, um, but one of my dear friends lives here and lives in Patagonia, and obviously after two years of the pandemic and the shutdown and all the, the bullshit that this world has been putting up with the last couple of years, you know, I wasn't going to not go and visit him while I was here. So. Um, so I came here to reconnect with an old friend and reconnect with a lot of old friends. <laughs> so that was the plan. <laughs> Where are we now? I have no idea. We're in the middle of a beautiful square, <laughs> in, the, in the beautiful sun, in the middle of Buenos Aires, and um, just kind of having a, you know, a chilled afternoon. Uh, my, my experience of coming to Argentina, and I've been coming to Argentina since 2007, each time my experience tends to be, um, you know, catching up with friends more than, more than, you know, like sightseeing, if you like, you know, like tourist stuff. So it's just catching up with friends, drinking and eating way too much, and, and you know, seeing people you haven't seen for a couple of years. Um, well, now, because of the pandemic, but... Yeah, this, uh, this trip, we've got this glorious opportunity to go to Patagonia, which I've been to once before with some friends and had a life-changing five days. So going back down there on Monday, it's gonna be fucking epic. So we, we were talking about this this morning, I think in maybe 2005 or six. I think we got introduced in 2006 by a mutual friend, Darren Shambhala. And then I came down here, the first time I played in Argentina it was my birthday weekend. Yeah, first of November. Yeah, and the, the Friday night I played in Rosario and Saturday I played in Niceto here. It was like the, the first, my first ever experience of an Argentinian crowd was in Rosario on my birthday. And at the end of the night, you and Roberto came out with a cake, you know, and the whole club was singing happy birthday. <laughs> It was fucking crazy. <laughs> I was like, wow. That, that's Argentinian. Yeah. Whoops. Yeah, it was, it was a magical moment. I'll never forget it. There's a fire and a fucking passion in Argentinian people. They, they, they feel the music at a very sort of internal, spiritual, soulful level. And their reaction is so passionate as a result because I think they... It's just, it's just a different, it's a different thing to anywhere else in the world. And there are other places in the world where the crowd goes completely nuts, but it's not quite, there's something very, very, very unique to Argentina that just doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. You know, one thing I really like, or, you know, liked, was the morning after the gigs 
in Rosario or Mar del Plata or La Plata or wherever, when you finish at six or seven o'clock in the morning and then you drive back with the morning sun to Buenos Aires and you've got that four hour journey and we're listening to fucking 80s music, like Javi and I listening to 80s music like really fucking loud. I love those car journeys, man. That's a classic. Oh, I remind you love the, the trip to Rosario. Yeah, man. so good. I remind you telling me, oh, this, yeah. this trip, I love it. I, I love it. You know, we... Um, we've, we've been many times We've done Rosario. that journey so many times. Yeah, more to Rosario than Mar del Plata. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Excellent. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool, actually. I am. Fucking perfect. We see. We see. I told you they dance tango here, John John. We came here once with Simon Patterson before the first batch. I told you we drank beer here, man. You remind. With Simon Patterson? Him, Simon and I. Yeah, first batch we did in 2008. You like this music? I love it. This is great. I think how the music goes from being really happy to really sad. To, it, the music sort of goes up and down in the emotions. It's a good music for sample, right? It's a good music for sample, right? Like using for... I don't know how I could, but... Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Think about it. I'm gonna think about it. I'll get back to you. Um, I was born in Cheltenham. My parents are, my father is English, my mother is Swedish. I became obsessed with music when I was uh, around 13. And then it has dominated my life ever since. Uh, initially, I was completely obsessed with rock and heavy metal, and I was, in, I was a guitarist in various rock bands from the age of um, maybe 14 onwards, and then 14, 15 onwards, and then electronic music kind of took over my life when I was about uh, maybe 17, 18, something like that just completely took over everything and then I changed from being in bands to um, you know being a DJ and then later on adding production to that because you know well there's two reasons really you, you, you need to produce records to get recognized outside of the country you live you need to be making records for promoters around the world to know who you are and to take notice, but predominantly the main reason I make records is so that I have the exact sound I want to play in my DJ sets. I make records specifically because that's what I want for my DJ sets. Seven is a collective of artists, obviously seven of them, that fall under a, a record label that I started to celebrate, at any given time, my favorite seven producers. So right now, the people who are in seven are my seven favorite producers. Simon Patterson, Will Atkinson, Greg Downey, myself, AA Meeting, Orchidea, and Everlight. I manage DJs as well. <laughs> I manage DJs, I look after record labels, and um, I obviously make music, release music. So yeah, it just involved in music constantly. I, music is, is, is what I do for a living, music, everything. Music for me is everything. There is, you know, in the good times in my life, in the bad times in my life, in the, in the moments of stress, the moments of chill, the moments of joy, the, in every single moment in my life, those moments have all been made so special by music. And that doesn't just mean at gigs, it means 
The first record I danced with my wife to, you know, shit like that is the backdrop of that moment in my life. You go on holiday with friends and there's that one record that you play over and over and over again for that two weeks and that becomes the anthem of that holiday, of that experience and music is fucking everything. I, I don't think I would be able to survive without it. I think every single human being has a tribal urge to dance. It's, it's something that's ingrained in the human species. Losing your fucking mind in those rhythms, I think that's what attracted me initially to electronic music and going clubbing and experiencing that music at very high volumes. So, um, electronic music to me is is one of the loves of my life. I've fallen in love a few times in my life and, and electronic music has a substantial portion of my heart, but so does fucking rock and heavy metal, which I fucking love. My main inspiration when I make music is my knowledge of music and my extensive um, collection of music. When I sit down to make a new record, I tend to spend a couple of days before that day um, listening to music. So I listen to a lot of music and because I, I Spotify has learnt me you know, Spotify's constantly suggesting cool new artists to me, and okay, it doesn't always get it right, but if it gets it right twice out of every 10, or, or three times out of every 10, that's still fucking cool. So, um, I find inspiration listening to the radio. We have an amazing radio station in, in the UK that you can listen to anywhere in the world, um, called BBC Six Music and that is a radio station that I feel reflects me as a person, the music I want to listen to, the, where my music, musical background came from versus what hot new bands and acts would be appropriate to me and that I would like. That's a fucking good radio station. BBC Six Music. Everyone should listen to it, it's brilliant. I draw inspiration from films. I draw inspiration from reading books. I draw inspiration from going to the fucking shop and seeing something funny that happens. You know, I draw inspiration from life. Uh, and I make music when that inspiration and when time allows um, but if I had one wish, it would be that I could have more studio time. Four things that all contributed. Number one was the night that I first discovered electronic music, which happened to be the night that I first took ecstasy as well. And I immediately, within a month, had quit the rock band that I was in, sold my guitars and bought decks, and, and was just like, this, this is what I want to do now. Um, that was a major significant part. A second one was CJ Bolland's album, The Fourth Sign, on RNS Records, which came out, in, I think, in 1994. That album definitely plays a huge role in, in, in me being the artist I am today. It's still my favorite electronic album of all time. And it's, it's just remarkable. It still sounds amazing today. So that's number two. Number three was probably getting my residency at Ministry of Sound in London. That changed my career from being a guy who was playing a lot of underground parties, a lot of um, illegal raves and, and, you know, fairly underground stuff to suddenly DJing alongside like big superstar DJs. And then in that process, the, the final thing was when I changed from being a resident at Ministry of Sound to being resident at the gallery at Turn Mills. And at that point, that's when everything really took off because at that moment, I also started re releasing records. I started Discover Records, the label, which I you know, later left um, to start working with Perfecto. And, but yeah, well, I mean, there's so many significant things, but I would say changing from rock to buying decks and becoming a DJ, CJ Boll and the Fourth Sign, that album, getting a residency for Ministry of Sound, and then getting my residency for, for Term Mills um, when, when things really just took off. Perfect Rave would start on Friday. 
It would finish on Monday and it would be, um, I would probably start on Friday with a really kind of mellow, you know, maybe a string quartet or something, just people arriving, beautiful sunshine. There's sort of, you know, lovely food everywhere. You're, you're getting cocktails and, 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 and lovely drinks. You come in and it's just fucking there, you know, everyone getting fucking drunk together, having a good time. And then the music gently, gently, gently goes up. And then I would probably have eight hours of John Digweed, Friday, Friday night into Saturday morning, maybe Hernan and Nick Warren back to back all day long Saturday. Um, yeah, Hernan and Nick Warren back to back all fucking day Saturday, just tripping out in the sun. It'd be amazing. And then Saturday night going through into Sunday, I would have seven. I would have all the guys in seven at the very, very, very end, like when the sun is coming up on the Sunday morning, Javier Bussola, three hour sunset set. Uh, when I make music, I use Logic 10. That's my preferred program. I see friends of mine who use Ableton, like Will Atkinson, Sean Tyus, and, and they work a lot quicker than I do, and it looks so fucking easy, but I just, I don't know, I'm old and I can't be fucked to learn something new. <laughs> so, and Logic works for me. I like the sound quality of the output. I like the functionality. There's some things in it which I do use Ableton to do in terms of time stretching or, or, or uh, if you're time stretching fairly complicated files um, uh, uh, that don't necessarily have a beat in them, I find Ableton better to do that than Logic. But on the whole, I love Logic. I love it. It's fucking brilliant. My favorite style of music that is not electronic music is rock and heavy metal. My favorite audience to play to is obviously Argentina. <laughs> Closely followed by Mexico. Mexico is also amazing as well. But there, there you know, it's, it's, a, it's a Latin thing. The Latin passion is for music and rhythm is, is so, you know, intoxicating it's it's so uh <laughs> it's so kind of i don't know hedonistic and tribal and fucking amazing so uh yeah i would say argentina i like to be mixing a lot uh, uh you know djs who um just play a record and then mix another record in and and, 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 you know, at a certain section and that's their set and that's it. I find that a little bit of a boring way to DJ. I like some tracks I only play for 30 seconds because I just want that part of the track. Some tracks I will have four tracks layered over the top of each other. Sometimes there'll be loops being played which are just completely separate to anything, that's, anything else that's being played at the time. I just there is a formula to sort of just playing trance that just, I don't know, it just goes like that all night long. And I think the same is for side trance. I think the same if, is for techno. I think the same is for fucking house music. So what I like to do is play all kinds of styles. I play house tracks that are 125 and I pitch them up to 140 because I just don't give a fuck how much bass you're losing. It just makes the record you play after it sound even more powerful. It's just a moment. It's just a, a, a change. But if you're telling a story and you're telling a story over six hours, you know, that story is going to be very boring if it's just the same all the way through. It's going to be boring. There needs to be moments where the melody is making you want to fucking fall in love. There's got to be moments where the techno is so fucking hard that it feels like your heart is going to burst through your chest. And then there's got to be other times when it's just drilling trance, which is just so emotionally charged with the melodies, but the drums are powerful as fuck. I am sort of going off playing open to close sets because I just want to play hard. 
I don't want to play the build-up bit anymore. I just want to play hard for ideally, you know, nothing, you know, five, six hours of just fucking hard. That's, that's what I'm into. If I hadn't have been a DJ, um, I would have been a ninja. Is there a track of someone else's that I wish I'd produced? Um, yeah, Adam Bayer's remix of Morgan, Flower Child. Greatest techno record ever written. I know I said that about CJ Bollin, but I'm, CJ Bollin's an album. This is a single track. Who would I like to collaborate with? Simon Patterson. We've made a couple of records together, but they always end up being chill out records. We, we get in the studio, we end up getting on that kind of vibe, you know, and, and, it, and it just becomes quite dreamy and we're like, wow, this is what we're into. But Simon and I have started a really, really, really banging collaboration. And it's been kind of going on for about a year and we just need to, I just need to get back into it properly. But I don't think there's anyone who programs and makes tracks the way Simon does. It was in Mardel Plata, and I'd played a club there. I can't remember the name of it, but it's right on the waterfront. And um, when we came out of the club, you know, there was loads of people there who had been at the party, and we were just hanging out and chatting, and we didn't need to leave straight away, so we walked on those black kind of rocks, those big fucking stones like a pontoon. So we walked all the way around to the end of it, and then we sat there as the sun was coming up and having a few drinks and maybe smoking a little bit, and it was just the perfect start to what became an, an amazing day. So that's, the track is called On The Rocks because of that moment. The first seven, six, seven months of COVID I absolutely loved, it's brilliant because the whole world was on holiday, essentially, and the weather was great in England, and I was pretty burnt out from traveling. So I needed, that six months was great for me. And then also, as an artist, I'd say it was good because all I did was make tunes. I was making music every single day, and it was amazing, it was glorious. So I loved it. I loved the first year of COVID. The second year, when a lot of stuff opened up, but not clubs, that's when I fucking hated it. Because the rest of the world had gone back to business, but we were still sitting at home for going, for fuck's sake, when's it gonna end? The first time I came to Argentina was um, on my birthday, 2007. So it, my birthday is the 1st of November, so I assume yeah, it was, it was on whatever weekend was there, right? So, and I played, the first gig I played was in Rosario, and that was my birthday. And then I came back and played Niceto in uh, Buenos Aires, which was, you know, was and still is my favorite club in the world. I, I absolutely adore Niceto, and I love Groove as well. Groove is absolutely amazing, the show at Groove was, was fucking amazing, absolutely amazing. But I do have a very, very special spot for Niceto. And um, so yeah, that was it. It was 2007, my birthday weekend. It was amazing, it was fantastic. And uh, it's just been, <laughs> you know, a non-stop love affair with this country has gone on ever since and it's, yeah, it's, it's my favorite place to come and visit. It's, I get the most excited about coming here because it's fucking amazing. I mean, there are loads of amazing stories about Argentina. I've, I've been to some incredible cities. I've, I've traveled around. I guess the greatest was, um, I think it was 2016 when I went with th three very dear friends of mine to Patagonia and we did this amazing, we flew into Calafate, we drove to this Estanza which was in the middle of fucking nowhere, like six hours down a dust track 
with these incredible big lakes that were cobalt blue, beautiful, absolutely beautiful, glacial lakes. And then we came to this estancia and you're like, well, how can anyone live this remote? You know, what happens if you just need to go and get some fucking milk? <laughs> we had a great night there with this, this proper old gaucho dude who was singing and we were getting drunk on red wine. And then the next day we walked for five days camping out in the most amazing wild places. And I've, uh, the scenery was ridiculous. The, 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 the adventure was ridiculous. And the fact that I was doing it with great friends and these two amazing mountain guides who were with us who were just such epic human beings. I just got to meet one of them for a drink last week, this week just gone actually. I went back to Patagonia and he was there. So um, we got to have a drink, which was great. Yeah, but that week for me was you know, the best. It was, it was a life-changing experience. I think the Argentinian crowd is so passionate and um, energetic because it's in the blood. It's, it's the Argentinian way. It's fire, it's passion, it's, it's getting sweaty, you know? It's, people don't just come here to have a drink and listen to the music. They come here to fucking go nuts for eight hours and come out <laughs> covered in sweat and maybe half a stone lighter, you know? It's in the blood. It's just the way it is.